day. But let's think about in terms of uh, folk arts, folk customs, these are things, again, as we've talked about, that uh, these are traditions, arts, customs that are brought to the Ozarks in the 1800s for the most part from uh, back east of the Mississippi, from Appalachia, from other places back east uh, with, the, with the earliest settlers. These are just practices that they were already familiar with and that are not unique to the Ozarks. They're things that link us with that frontier experience of Americans moving across uh, the North American continent. And uh, all of these things would have been very common in the 19th century Ozarks, and some of these would have been common well into the 20th century Ozarks as well. Some of these uh, folk customs had to do with life on the frontier and activities on the frontier. You remember last time we talked about when the settlers came, there was a certain order that, you know, they, they needed to build themselves a shelter and then they cleared fields and made fence rails and all that kind of stuff. And these folk customs and folk activities often spring up around these necessities of frontier life so that a house raising became a community or at least a neighborhood sort of event, a house raising would involve the building of a house. And in the 19th century Ozarks, this would most often be uh, a one-room cabin, a one-room pen of some sort. And it was an activity that a group of men could do in, in very short order, especially if you had uh, one or two who were really handy with an ax and good at notching logs and, and that kind of thing. And, and practically every community back in those days would have had somebody who fit that description. And a house could be put together pretty quickly. Uh, you could also have, you've heard of barn raisings. Uh, you could have uh, crib raisings. Uh, just any, any sort of building activity. And this would bring people from the community together to, say, build a house for somebody. And the payoff at the end of the day for a, for a long, hard day's labor, or maybe two or three days uh, worth of labor, would be... Uh, a party at the end of the day, a big, a big meal. Well, usually you'd have a, a big dinner. And in the Ozarks, when do you eat dinner? In the middle of the day, you dine around noon, you sup in the evening. So it's dinner and supper. Uh, just don't get that wrong. That's, that's a, a bad mistake in the Ozarks. Although, for the most part, we've conformed with the rest of society and we've started talking about lunch and, and dinner, but for old time Ozarkers, it's dinner and supper. But you would have a big dinner uh, that the women uh, would prepare during the day while the, the men were working. And then at night, uh, you would eat again and, and often have a party with dancing, uh, fiddle music, maybe, uh, unless it was a very sort of, you know, tamped down religious uh, family who might not believe in dancing or something like that, but dancing. Usually there would be some sort of whiskey involved, a little bit of wildcat involved in this. That was one of the payoffs. That was one of the ways to get men to come out and help, uh, promising that there will be a couple jugs passed around at the, at the end of the day, and you can imbibe freely. But uh, I think I've got here, if I can find it, uh, yeah, here's a, now this is an account of a house raising, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this. It's a house raising, uh, and it's actually a, a smokehouse raising. This is a family and a neighborhood who got together to build a smokehouse, and it's a, it's a good description. It's late 1800s, it's not pre-Civil War, but it's in the rural Ozarks in Arkansas, and the guy writing about it, he's actually writing in the 20th century as an older man, but he's remembering back to his childhood uh, well back into the 1800s. And he writes, uh, uh, I got, he was a, a kid at this time. I got on my horse and rode over the settlement, inviting the men and women to come to our house the following Thursday. The men to the house raising and the women to the quilting. So they were, they had, the women were having a, 
a social function as well. While the men were building the smokehouse, the women were going to be quilting, uh, doing the old quilting bee sort of thing. That was one way we had of getting along. Every man stood ready to assist his neighbor in doing something that he could not do alone. There were 12 or 15 men at our house that morning, and every man had brought his wife, daughter, or sister. We began on the smokehouse by laying two logs about 14 feet apart. With axes, we cut notches in the ends of the logs, then built on up to the height we wanted. There were men on hand who were very proficient in notching the ends and keeping the corners even, and while the process was slow, we had the walls up before night. On occasions like this, people expected something a little more pleasant than hard work. My father had supplied himself with a gallon of whiskey, and when we went in to dinner, he brought out the jug and every one of the men took a drink. My mother also looked out for her friends. She had obtained two bottles of Garrett snuff, and as the, woman, as the women quilted, they passed around the snuff bottle often, and all would take a dip. Now, this was, a, this was very common uh, in the Ozarks well into the 20th century uh, for women to dip snuff. For a toothbrush, each procured a small green stick, preferably black gum, and chewed one end of it until it was soft. They would then dip the mop end of the stick into the snuff and put it into their mouths. And he's still talking about the women here. This, the uh, snuffing women. When the walls of the house were up and the quilting finished, the people all went home. But most of them came back that night, for it was the custom on such occasions to give either a social or a party. We gave a social, for party was just another word for dance. We, all, we had all the improved land we could work, but a tract of about five acres was worn out. It was so old and worn that it would not produce corn or wheat, and when land got that way, it was fit only for pasturing. Yeah, I didn't want to read that. Let's see. Uh, oh, here, here's the, the log rowing part. As the spring grew near, it was time to row logs. During the fall and winter, many trees had fallen in the field, and they had to be piled up and burned. We didn't cut them up for firewood, for timber was too plentiful. My father and I went into the field and chopped the logs into toting lengths, and we invited our neighbors into a log rowing. About 15 men, probably the same ones, came bringing hand sticks with them. We shoved hand sticks under the logs, and the men would take hold of the hand sticks, a man at each end of the stick, remember we talked about this with log rowings, and pick up the log and tote it to the spot where we decided to make the log heap. When the logs were all gathered into piles, we could then set fire to them and burn them up. And then he goes on to talk about how uh, these log rowings were, were opportunities for men to display their strength and to try to show that they were stronger than the other men because one of the things that they would do is, remember, you were always working in tandem with at least one other guy. If the logs were short enough, you, you had your two sticks and you, you hoisted them up and there's a, a guy holding the other ends of the sticks and whoever could lift the log higher and sort of roll it on the, on the guy who couldn't, he's the stronger guy, or maybe just the taller guy, and he could be. But uh, that was, apparently that was something kind of fun to do, unless you were the, the, you got the bad end of it and the log rolled on top of you. But these, again, were community functions uh, designed to bring people together. You think about how much time a family in the 1800s, in the rural Ozarks, spent just with themselves and not socializing with neighbors. And they really, the, the, humans are social creatures, most of us. Not all of us are, but uh, most of us. And they tried to think of any opportunity that they could to have social gatherings. And, and most of them had to do with work in those days. And, and we all know if you've, if you've done any sort of uh, social work experiment, yeah, it makes the work go faster. You get to visit with neighbors. You know, the day goes by quicker, that kind of stuff. And the women would, you know, find their, uh, their opportunities to socialize as well, having quiltings while snuffing. You know, that's... Uh, any of you ever been around a, uh, a woman... Dipping snuff? My great grandmother. Your great grandma, yeah. Does she have a, a snuff stick or just, just put it in there? Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I can remember older 
women in my family when I was a kid used to do that. And I had this, this one, it was a great aunt, and her house always smelled like snuff and cats. Because she had, she had several cats in there and newspaper. You know, if you got cats in your house, I guess you have newspaper everywhere. But uh, I still remember that smell from, uh, in, from when I was a kid in the, in the 70s, snuff and cats. You know, not, not the best smell in the world, but, uh, but I, have, I haven't been around a, a, you know, a snuff-dipping dipping woman in a while. I don't know how that's, you know, 